Hello everyone, how are you doing? Today we will be summarizing for you the dioxygen reactivity in copper. You have seen so far many different copper enzymes. Of course, the first one perhaps comes to your mind is the hemocyanin. Hemocyanin is having two copper centers with three histidine on each of them and this is a colorless compound upon binding with oxygen it gives you very nice blue color compound this one where three histidine are on each copper centers and oxygen is reduced by two electrons one from each copper centers and these coppers are now plus two oxidation step. So, this is a simple and beautiful reaction, but the best thing about this reaction is it is just acting as a oxygen transporting agent. It does not react with any organic substrate, although these species, these active species are capable of reacting with organic substrate. That is exactly what we see in another enzyme as you might will remember tyrosinase. So, the tyrosinase utilizes exactly same active species that is two copper one center is supported by three histidine are reacting with oxygen to give the dinuclear this copper two side on bound peroxo species. So, once again this oxygen is reduced by two electron, but the only difference between hemocyanin and tyrosinase is now you have a phenol appended to this active site. What will happen as you know these side on peroxo are electrophilic in nature and therefore an electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction happens giving rise from phenol or tyrosine to catechol and water molecule. On the other hand if you take this catechol product into the reaction you get quinone. So, cresolase activity and catecholase activity you can see in with respect to the tyrosinase. I think that is that is really really fascinating right. So, what we essentially see here is nature's design or desire to carry out these reactions in an efficient manner, but in a 100 percent controlled manner. In hemocyanin exactly same species as that of tyrosinase, but in hemocyanin we have only oxygen carrying properties. In tyrosinase the same active species is utilized to do the substrate oxygenation chemistry. I think that is really really um, really really important to understand that nature did not put anything just for fun. Once again it has the desired motive or desired intention by which uh, it carries out a certain reactivity. Okay. So, the reactive elements or reactive species nature has chosen are limited, but the design is such that that those activities are controlled 100 percent. Sometime very reactive intermediates are generated, but without using them they can do their activity. Sometime these reactive intermediates are used or utilized for their reactivity purpose such as hemocyanin versus tyrosinase. Well, these are the dinuclear species and you have seen synthetically in laboratory if you are want to synthesize these compound you run into problem I would say. Many different types of dinuclear species not to mention these one, but let us say just focus on this one to keep it simple. These different types of dinuclear species can be generated. If the ligand in synthetic setup, now this is now not in enzyme right, this is just let us say nothing to do with enzyme at this point. If you take a ligand tetradented ligand then you can get an end on peroxo quite interestingly this is nucleophilic in nature as we have mentioned this is going to be delta minus. If you are taking a tridented ligand most often you end up getting the side on bound peroxo species these are electrophilic in nature as you have seen aromatic hydroxylation reaction is possible by electrophilic aromatic substitution mode. If you have often a bidented ligand then you end up going to get this bismuoxo species where copper is now plus 3 oxidation state. 
in these cases copper are in plus 2 oxidation state only this case copper is in plus 3 oxidation state. Essentially from oxygen molecule dioxygen molecule you have broken all the bonds between the oxygen oxygen to get into this bismuth oxo species. This species it is also believed to be the active species in tyrosinase in addition to this Sidon peroxo species. There is enough literature report now which suggests that this although forms fast, but during phenol interaction this is the species which is being generated and therefore this is the true active species as opposed to perhaps this one. Just to give you a quick hint over here we were discussing that this is the final product or this is the real active species. The recent studies very recent studies suggest that it is it is the paroxo to start with, but then during phenol interaction especially with phenolate it is the bis muoxo this species that is generate. As you have noted that these species are in equilibrium with each other therefore it is very difficult to maintain 100 percent purity between one versus another although both of them are capable of doing the chemistry. It is also to be noted that these are completely ligand control mode of reaction well not necessarily tetradented ligand has to be always giving this there are exceptions which which violates the usual uh, understanding that is tetradented tridented and bidented ligand system gives all these species there are enough sterically crowded or electronically um, electronically electronically uh, monitored ligand which can which can cross the barrier and can give one versus another. But perhaps most importantly these species these dinuclear species are forming through the mono uh, mononuclear intermediate. So, one of these mononuclear intermediate is involved during these dinuclear species formation we will come back to these soon. Okay. So, these species these dinuclear species as you have seen earlier will have very characteristic spectroscopic features including UV visible resonance Raman of course, XFs whatever spectroscopic features you want to uh, characterize them with they are completely distinct and identifiable. These are very very low temperature intermediate these are not that very stable intermediate these are extremely reactive intermediate all of them will at room temperature or at higher temperature or even at low temperature will undergo further reaction to give you the decomposition product hydroxylated product you know dimeric hydroxylated product different product from these can be generated. Okay. These are so reactive even the ligand for the metal center can also get affected depending on its design. Okay. All these chemistry if you are trying to study in your laboratory you have to do under the inert atmosphere like, like under nitrogen atmosphere or under argon atmosphere some of the handling has to be done at globe box condition or under globe box condition. You can store these compound the starting material let us say ligand copper 1 complexes you have to store it under the inert atmosphere often it is stored in the glove box right. So, these temperature these reactions are also extremely temperature sensitive if you are doing at a high temperature such as room temperature which is considered very high for these species you will not able to see any intermediate formation. You have to slow down the reaction by going that uh, lowering the temperature to let us say minus 80 degree centigrade minus 120 degree centigrade and so on. So, therefore, uh, you have to choose the right solvent also because solvent should not freeze at those particular temperature. So, we have discussed those earlier in any case I think what we are trying to tell you that these skin sensitive chemistries are of course, very powerful right they can do the reaction they can do the synthetic transformation the type of transformation a synthetic organic chemist perhaps could never think of doing that is that is the beauty of these species right. So, you have the different species completely crystallographically characterized these species has direct relevance in hemocyanin this is also has direct relevance in in tyrosinase but, uh, but perhaps both of these species are having both of these copper cores are having a relevance in tyrosinase that we have seen earlier. Okay. Let us move on let us try to discuss mononuclear copper oxygen chemistry. So, of course, dinuclear copper oxygen chemistry is interesting, but mononuclear copper oxygen chemistry even is even much more uh, sensitive 
and therefore, it has to be dealt with extreme care not that dioxygen dicopper chemistry is not sensitive, but mononuclear chemistry is super sensitive right. Because these are the intermediate which forms prior to your dinuclear species formation these are kinetically form first formed product right. These are the first step and therefore, and this first step leads to the second step which is the peroxo species formation let us say for example, those dinuclear, but stabilizing them is extremely difficult. We have seen many enzymes where we have these um, mononuclear copper oxygen species, two of them we discussed, one of them is PHM, the other is DBM. These are homologous copper protein meaning that what is true for one is also going to be true for the other one. Okay. Both PHM and DBM can do the substrate hydroxylation. Okay. As you can see the substrate is getting hydroxylated by copper oxygen species, but these copper oxygen species are not the binuclear one, this is the mononuclear one. Quite interestingly though if you look at this active site there is this dinuclear or two copper center, yet only one copper center is doing the chemistry. Okay. So, they catalyze both of them catalyze production of neurohormones and neurotransmitters which are quite quite ex extensively uh, studied and quite important so far we have understood that right. So, here is the two copper center although once again although these are mononuclear copper oxygen species that is going to be formed over here nothing happen over here in terms of the copper oxygen chemistry. As you see this beautiful crystal structure of the starting material this is the reduced form, this whole structure is for the reduced form. If you react it with oxygen it gives rise to this mononuclear copper superoxo species. We have discussed the debate in this field and that is even if this crystal structure is known people believe that just like tyrosinase peroxo and bismioxo here people believe that not the superoxo perhaps other species such as hydroperoxo or the copper oxo mononuclear copper oxo is the real active intermediate. But there is also enough proof in favor of these mononuclear copper superoxo species. So, that is forming over there nothing happens over there and is the real active species. Okay. Let us look at the mechanism that we have tried to look earlier. So, this is the two copper centers separated by 11 angstrom, no oxygen activity happens here. This is the site where oxygen activation occurs, oxygen binds, substrate binds, electron transfer occurs. So, copper superoxo species form, superoxo abstract hydrogen atom from the substrate saying that this is the active species. Okay, in this form of the mechanistic hypothesis, it is forming copper to hydroperoxo species which is giving rise to the radical formation. Then this, uh, this oxygen oxygen bond cleavage gives rise to the hydroxy radical and that transfer over there and leaving out copper to O dot which is nothing but Cu3 plus double bond O. right? Cu2O dot is Cu3 double bond O, the cupril species. Okay. Now, this cupril and the radical will combine to give the copper alkoxide and then the product goes out and ascorbate comes into the picture for reducing the copper center and overall catalytic cycle goes on. The similar mechanism one can draw for copper hydroperoxo as the active species that means that this substrate will not be reacting with this one at this step in that alternative mechanism, but this electron transfer will be over here. So, it forms peroxo and a protonation gives the hydroperoxo, this substrate will be sitting without this hydrogen atom abstraction because if we are saying that hydroperoxo is the active species, hydroperoxo will abstract the hydrogen atom. So, in that op mechanism you have seen that almost everything not ev almost everything, everything falls into place, but the active species changes little bit change of these relative steps like electron transfer over here and proton transfer over here and the CH activation over there that takes place. So, all these alteration can go on, but 
we should know that still this debate exists and this is pretty much alive. If you are excited, you can contribute perhaps towards this because this is really important enzyme. These are a really important enzyme and that is PHM and DBM which is you know which is quite interesting from the perspective of the neurohormones and neurotransmitter biosynthesis. So, it is a it is one one really important enzyme to understand, but state of the art understanding is none of them you can rule out at present. Maybe decades and century of research will, will rule uh, favor in favor of one of these enzyme. So, this species people are able to synthesize and see that it is reactive. This species also uh, people are able to synthesize and found that this is also reactive for hydroxylation. Of course, the substrate has to be judiciously cho uh, chosen, but nonetheless this species is always believed to be much better than these two species, but synthetically no direct examples uh, or crystallographically characterized inter uh, example exist. So, this is an elusive intermediate, but then there are enough proposals so far in the literature saying that these are the species which is doing the chemistry this debate we have discussed earlier. So, you can you can you can refer to our earlier classes, but these remains the plausible intermediate for doing the chemistry. Okay. Moving on as we have seen earlier the first form species the super sensitive ligand copper 1 if you have ligand and associated with copper 1 and these species are going to be very very reactive. Okay. Usually perchlorate uh, PF6 barf um, or you know uh, BF4 minus or so these sort of these sort of counter anions are used with this ligand copper 1. It reacts with oxygen to give the superoxo intermediate. Subsequently, a proton and electron transfer to this intermediate gives rise to the hydroperoxo species. It is the combination of H dot and uh, alternatively this can react with another equivalent of copper 1 to give an end on bound peroxo if the ligand is the tetradented ligand. If ligand is the tridented one this superoxo species can react with this tridented bound copper 1 to give you the side on bound peroxo species. If these ligands are tridented also then also there could be this equilibrium usually with the bidented ligand you see this sort of species formation, but as you can see these are all in equilibrium. So, depending on the ligand whether it is a aliphatic donor or an aromatic donor whether it is a nitrogen donor or oxygen donor or sulfur donor depending on that this chemistry can get even more interesting. Okay. Even this end on peroxo can be also in equilibrium or can be converted to this bismioxo species. This is picture showing that everything is linked or interrelated. So, there is an opportunity for settling between or among these species uh, in the reaction solution. So, this makes the lig ligand copper chemistry or synthetic chemistry very 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 sensitive as well as difficult to fish out for, for its reactivity. But as we mentioned these are nucleophilic in nature, these are electrophilic in nature, these are electrophilic in nature. So, therefore, uh, enough chemistry can be done with this chemistry okay, enough with these species. Right. So, we have seen that these species are completely well understood I would say at this point where uh, the ligand be it tetradented, tridented or bidented let us say this study is done with the tetradented which can react with oxygen to give the superoxo species. Now, it is characterized and it been confidently can be said that uh, this is an end on bound superoxo not the side on bound one this end on bound superoxo where one of the oxygen atom is bound with the metal center another oxygen is far away from the copper center or not really bound just like this. So, if both of the oxygens are bound with this copper center it would be called side on bound superoxo species. This is an end on bound superoxo species it can react with another equivalent of this ligand copper 1 complex to give you the end on bound peroxo species which is quite clean and simple to understand. You can follow these reactions by UV visible spectra even you can follow this intermediate is disappearing towards formation of this. So, there is no doubt this is the intermediate for 
for this type of species formation. We have seen those spectra and these studies need to be done once again at very low temperature and if you want to see something like this intermediate you have to really really utilize the best spectroscopic technique, the fastest possible spectroscopic technique. We have seen the stop flow kinetics data how within a second hundreds of data point can be collected and those data point can build up to the story and can, can tell very clearly that this intermediate is present in those cases. Now moving on um, as we have, we have discussed that there are relevance for, for these intermediate for, for these intermediate where both the superoxo and alkoxo species can be generated for the mononuclear one. So, mononuclear superoxo species can be synthetically uh, synthetically um, synthetically achieved characterized and also it can be shown that this is perhaps the pathway followed and we can also get the crystal structure of such intermediate. So, there is enough proof so far in the literature that suggests that the mononuclear superoxo can be generated and can do the chemistry right. Moving on there are many different compounds that is now characterized not too many, but decent enough both the or all the end on bound superoxo so far shows that they are also capable of abstracting hydrogen atom from organic substrate just what is seen in the PHM and DBM cases. These enzyme once again are involved in neurohormone and neurotransmitter biosynthesis and therefore, the implication of the synthetic studies saying that these are involved into the hydrogen atom abstraction is quite phenomenal right. And we also have seen that scientists were able to synthesize this sort of copper hydroperoxo species by appending the substrate within the ligand moiety it is also able to show that or scientists were able to show that this ND alkylation or substrate oxygenation and subsequent um, rearrangement chemistry or subsequent follow up chemistry can gives rise to the ND alkylation chemistry. So, suggesting that these not only copper superoxo, but copper hydroperoxo are also capable of doing this chemistry right. So, in the perspective of the enzyme I uh, we therefore, I think we understand that both superoxo and hydroperoxo are capable in forming the forming the desired uh, desired substrate hydroxylation chemistry. Well, for the hydroperoxo species uh, summary then we, we know that it is possible to do these hydroperox synthesize these hydroperoxo species. These hydroperoxo species are capable of cleaving the carbon carbon bond or the carbon nitrogen bond or of different type of bond hydroxylation process can be possible to then put this whole thing in the perspective both the enzyme PHM and DBM are still very much in the picture in terms of understanding them in greater detail. Synthetic studies so far suggest that it is perhaps both superoxo and hydroperoxo are capable of doing the substrate hydroxylation chemistry in PHM and DBM. But nonetheless, I think more, more and more people started believing that it is the copper superoxo species just like just like what we see in the iron cases these copper superoxo species sorry copper um, high valent oxo species is going to be the real active site ok. So, in case of uh, in case of copper one one can think of reacting it with oxygen that is what we have seen right. So, it can be reacting of course, there is a ligand present depending on the ligand geometry will change, but the chemistry will remain similar. So, you will get ligand copper 2 O dot right. So, this this is ligand copper 2 O dot. So, that is how the homolytic cleavage if you are following and then from there on you can you can add an H dot which is nothing but H plus plus electron to give you copper 2 O H right. Now, this copper 2 O O H can be further further transpo, transformed into 
giving you copper 3 OH or copper 4 OH. So, for example, if this is the mode, so you can form copper 4 oxo. So far, of course, this also has been proposed as one of the reactive intermediate, but never really uh, have any proof so far in the literature. But what is also possible that you can have a homolytic cleavage to give you Cu2O dot, right, giving rise to along with uh, OH dot formation right. So, that is possible in this case what you are having is HO minus out. So, which can be protonated to give you water species. So, that is putative, but of course, no, no direct evidence exists for this. Now, this Cu2O dot is nothing but your Cu3 Cu3O, this is the cupril. These people believe that, uh, that one of the in important intermediate in the whole process, right. So, overall as you can see, this Cu2O dot uh, or Cu2OO dot can react with H atom to come over here. Of course, this hydroperoxo then can react to give you, uh, give you these species. Alternatively, um, it can form copper 2 O dot to give you copper 3 oxyl or uh, cupril species, both of them are high valent cupril species and uh, the, these are quite, quite phenomenal species. People believe that this is what exactly is happening in, in, case, of, in case of the PHM and DVM. This still remain a debate which is the active species, whether this is the species or this is the species or even this is the species. Even some people end up suggesting these are the species, right. All these species can be, um, can, can be further, further uh, debated, but, uh, but, but uh, again in, in absence of the suitable, suitable, um, suitable um, you know experimental studies we can we can keep uh, keep thinking that these are the all possible intermediate that is responsible for the chemistry right also you you should know that they, there are similarities between between these species and that is these these can these can form quite exciting intermediate themselves uh, for instance um, if you are looking at at the iron chemistry, iron chemistry and copper chemistry can also go parallel that I will discuss in the ne next class. But let, let me try to say that this copper 2 OOH, the species that we were discussing earlier or, or even, uh, even copper 2 OO super oxo species, these are then can react with copper 1, ligand copper 1 to give you this uh, copper 2 O O. So, this can give you one electron and that can give you another electron to give you the peroxo. If this super oxo is side on bound in nature, so once again it is the same, this is one oxygen, sorry for the drawing and um, this, this again can give another electron into the four, uh, into the mixture to give you copper 2 O O whole thing copper 2 right that is how the chemistry is happening and, um, and overall this chemistry can go on. Now I hope you have seen that copper oxygen chemistry is really exciting right. Um, these are uh, mononuclear chemistry, these are dinuclear chemistry and one thing we did not discuss there are multinuclear chemistry as well we have discussed earlier right. There are multi copper oxidases which can even convert your oxygen to water much like what you have seen in the, in the case of cytochrome C oxidase, right. So, there are mononuclear chemistry, dinuclear chemistry and multinuclear copper chemistry which can, which can you know kind of um, parallel to what we know in the iron chemistry, okay. We will see the summary of the iron chemistry shown Keep studying and good luck with the exam which will be shown. Thank you very much.